Hi, welcome to Visiting Professionals. I am your host, Austin Slaboff. If you've ever heard this before, Here's a pass up the right side of Datsuk, moves over the Washington line, he shoots, he scores! Ah, oh, it's music to my ears. Then you must know Ken Cal, the voice of the Detroit Red Wings, here with me today. We're gonna see what he does day in and day out here at the Joe Louis Arena. Hi, my name is Austin Slaybaugh. I'm a student at Oakland University. Most of my time is spent on campus in class. But when I'm not hitting the books, I'm visiting professionals. On a crisp fall day in Michigan, I made my way to the legendary Joe Louis Arena in Detroit. The Joe is home to the national hockey team, the Detroit Red Wings. Today, I'm visiting radio broadcaster Ken Cow. Ken has been the play-by-play -play announcer for the Wings for over 16 seasons and calls each and every game on the radio. Not only does Ken call the games, he also hosts the game day preview segment for DetroitRedWings.com. Once inside the Joe, I made my way to the rink where I was to meet Ken Cow during the Red Wings game day morning skate. The morning skate looked intense, but the players seemed like they were having a good old time on the ice. Off the ice, Ken was in the stands filming his intro for the game day preview. fans, Ken Cal for Game Day Preview, presented by Comerica Bank. The Red Wings are back in hockey town to face off against Alexander Ovechkin and the Washington Capitals tonight. The Red Wings snapped a two-game skid as they skated to a dramatic 4-3 overtime victory against the Ottawa Senators. Gustav Nyquist, who had a goal and an assist, set up Thomas Tatar's game-winning goal in the extra session. We followed Ken into the Detroit Red Wings locker room where he was busy collecting interview sound bites for the pregame show. There's been tons of chances I've had where I haven't buried and a few open nets. And, uh, so if you look at stats and goals, I think you know I'd, I'd like more. After the locker room interviews, Ken met with head coach Jeff Blasio to collect even more sound bites. Jeff, how do you stay professional day in and day out dealing with us in the media? You know, I have lots of respect for the people in the media. They're, they're trying to do their best job, probably like any uh, group of, of organizations or people. Um, there's some that are great uh, as, as people and some that aren't great people. The same thing with coaches. So I try to treat the ones that are great people with great respect and, uh, and, and handle it that way. For Comerica Bank Game Day Preview, I'm Ken Cal. Enjoy the game. Coming up, I get the opportunity to sit down with the man himself, Ken Cal, and ask him some questions. Then later, we get a tour of the radio booth where I get to sit in with Ken Cal during the game. Here's a break for Detroit. A drive, the weak score. Power play goal. Detroit on top. When visiting professionals continues. You know what, guys? There's a lot of tree branches and dry brush over here. We should probably move the bonfire over there. I'm guessing Smokey liked that idea. Welcome back to Visiting Professionals. Today, I'm at the Joe Louis Arena visiting Ken Cow, the radio play-by-play -play broadcaster for the national hockey team, the Detroit Red Wings. I've come here today to ask Ken Cow some important questions about becoming a professional. After Ken was done filming his game day preview for DetroitRedWings.com, I was able to sit down with him and ask him some questions one-on-one. -on -one. Okay, now I know everybody knows you as the voice of the Detroit Red Wings and that's how people know you, that's how people hear you is your voice. Now I have you here and I, I'm looking at you and I know everybody at home wants to know, uh, tell me, who, who's Ken Cal, the person? What do you do, like where did you grow up, are you from Michigan? Yeah, I grew up in the city of Detroit on the west side near the Rouge Park area and uh, lived here all my life. And I'm very fortunate in the fact that uh, not many broadcasters can actually go to college in their own home state 
and actually call their hometown team. So I've been very fortunate, but uh, grew up here all my life, uh, native Detroiter, uh, enjoy the city, and just a great place to be. How did you get interested in broadcasting? When did it ever occur to you that this is what you wanted to do? Well, when I was 10 years old, actually, I always enjoyed hockey, and uh, I'd play in the backyard with a tennis ball and a stick, and you know, I, I, I would start you know, mimicking the, the hockey announcers at the time, Bud Lynch, Bruce Martin, and I would actually tape their games off the radio and television. My dad bought me a tape recorder, one of these small Iowa tape recorders, and I would practice. And then I'd go outside and I'd take the tennis ball. And back then it was, how did Elvecchio a shot he scores? You know, and, and uh, you know, I remember telling my dad one time, I said, Dad, you know, one of these days I want to be the Red Wing announcer. Now, as you go through life, you don't know where your life, what direction your life is going to take you. And uh, just so fortunately worked out for me. And uh, here I am today, so everything just worked out. I know being a 10-year-old boy and talking to your dad and uh, telling him that's a lofty goal, did your dad support you at all? Uh, what, what did he have to say about that when you told him that that was your dream and what you wanted to do? Well, he probably thought I was crazy, you know. <laughs> he said, I'll just let him do what he wants to do, you know. But, uh, you know, everyone has goals and aspirations, I guess, when you're young. And, and um, you know, he was always a sports guy, and he enjoyed all sports, football, baseball, hockey. And, and he really just let me do what I wanted to do, you know? And I, I think the, uh, the most important thing that my dad did, Austin, was the fact that, uh, you know, he really gave me my first break by buying me that tape recorder for the first time. So, uh, you know, that, that started me going in, in the broadcast world, I guess. And I used to practice and practice all the time, and it was a lot of fun. But. Did this influence your choice to uh, go to Wayne State um, growing up, uh, wanting to uh, do broadcasting? Uh, was that a reason why you went there? Well, I had uh, my sister, both sisters went to Wayne State, and I figured, well, they got a good education there. I might as well go to Wayne State, too. But actually, uh, I was going to be an undertaker. That's what I went in there for. I had a friend who owned a funeral home. His dad owned a funeral home. And he told me, he says, hey, if you go to school, I'll hire you when you get out. And Back then it was a three-year program, so I figured, well, three years, I'm out, at least I'll have a job. Mm -hmm. But a funny thing happened when I was a freshman, I was walking down the street and I passed our campus radio station, WAYN. And I looked in and I always liked radio. I thought it was a fun medium and I, 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 I said, you know, I'm going to inquire. So I, I went up there and I talked to one of the station managers there and, you know, talked a little bit about how you can get involved in it. And it was kind of a volunteer type thing, but you learned radio as well. So uh, uh, I got in. And uh, the next thing you know, after a year and a half, it came time to declare a major. And I said, you know, I'm having a lot of fun with this radio gig. And uh, I was doing all sorts of things. Uh, you know, I was a DJ. I was doing news and sports. And I said, you know, I, I think I'm going to go in this direction. And I think, you know, I, I think I'll put the, the undertaking to the side. <laughs> and I think I'm going to go into the broadcast route. And, uh, again, everything all worked out. Now, did you ever explore any other parts of broadcasting? Like, did you ever think that you wanted to go on TV at first, or did you just get hooked on radio and that's just something you fell in love with? Or I always liked radio because I always thought it was fun. And even as a kid, uh, back in the day when I was growing up, we had transistor radios, and I remember listening to Ernie Harwell and you know Bruce Martin, and I would go to bed at night like a lot of people do, and you listen to those late night West Coast games, and I always thought it was magical radio. And and the the thing about radio is is you really, it's an art form. You really have to paint the picture for the listener. And Ernie Harwell did such a great job. Bruce Martin, Bud Lynch did a great job doing it. George Blaha does a good job with it. Mark Champion, the list goes on and on. Uh, and now Dan Miller, Dan Dickerson, George Kell. I, I mean, it, it was really a really good medium and, and I really enjoyed that part of it. Television, there's a lot, lot of people that are involved and uh, to be honest with you, I listen more to the radio than I watch TV, so it was good for me. When we come back, Ken Cow explains how he became the voice of the Detroit Red Wings. All right, Ken, so tell me, how did you become the voice of the Detroit Red Wings? And later, Ken gives us a tour of the radio broadcast booth where I sit in for the game. When visiting professionals continues. People think I'm trash. They're wrong. Today I'm just an aluminum can, but one day I could be a stadium. There's a shelter pet who wants to meet you. 
Meet one today. Visit the shelterpetproject.org. Adopt. Welcome back to Visiting Professionals. Today, we're inside Joe Lewis Arena visiting Ken Cal, the radio voice of the Detroit Red Wings. All right, Ken, so tell me, how did you become the voice of the Detroit Red Wings? There were 350 people that applied for the position, and at the time, I was broadcasting University of Michigan hockey for 11, it was my 11th season at Michigan. And um, when Bruce Martin retired, uh, I, I didn't think I had a shot, to be honest with you, and I wasn't even gonna put my name in the hat. But my analyst for Michigan Hockey, his name was Jim Hunt, kept prodding me. He kept saying, aren't you going to submit your tape? You know, you can make it. You know, you're the heir apparent to, to Bruce Martin. I'm like, you know, you're out of your mind. You know, I said, there's no way they're going to hire a kid out of college, you know, like me, or, or doing college hockey. So he said, no, put your tape in and, and uh, give it a shot. So I did. Didn't hear anything. And I figured, well, you know. I, I, I didn't figure I was going to get it anyway, right? But then I got a call, and um, actually I was selling in the medical field. That was my full-time job, and I was doing Michigan part-time, and I was in Indianapolis at a conference, and um, the Red Wings called and said, Ken, would you come in for an interview? And I said, well, yeah, sure, you know. So um, I think it was a week later I came in, and I interviewed with Mr. Illich and his son, Atanas, and he listened to my tape, I had a five-minute demo tape, and he listened to it right there, took some notes, and um, at the end of the interview, he said, we really like you. He says, we have to interview a couple more people, but just hang tight, and a week later, they offered me the job, and I was the happiest guy in the world. Yeah, I wouldn't doubt it. That sounds like you'd be the happiest <laughs> guy in the world. Now, you said 350 people applied. Uh, what, in your skills, what do you think made you stand out from the other 350 candidates that applied for the job? That's a good question, Austin. I, I think that uh, at the time, uh, the Red Wings were big into college hockey at the Joe, and I had an extensive college hockey background, so I think that helped me out a little bit. The other thing was just, I think I was ready. I, I spent 11 years at Michigan, and I remember one time I was at Michigan, and uh, we, we did a weekly Red Berenson show, and Red and I became really good friends over the years, and uh, he walked into the radio show on a Tuesday night one time, and he said, Ken, he says, you're done at Michigan. And I go, are you firing me or what? And he says, no, no, no. He says, you're ready for the next step. He said, I listen to your broadcast, you know, and, and I, I think you're ready to go to the next step. He says, but it's all up to you, you know. So I, I really didn't think much of it. But when the Red Wing job opened up and I got a little prodding from Jim Hunt, um, you know, it all worked out. Tell me, now that you're here and you are with the Red Wings, uh, what's uh, some of your responsibilities like on game day? Tell me how you prepare. Well, a lot of people think that you, you get on the air at 7 o'clock and, and uh, you do the game and when you're done, you go home. That's far from the truth. I mean, there's a lot of work involved and there's a lot of preparation work. And I, we do 82 regular season games, not counting the preseason and postseason games. And I tell broadcasting students, I say it's like cramming for 82 exams. And uh, basically, I cover the morning skate. Uh, for both teams and then prepare in the afternoon and broadcast the game at night. The hard part is preparing for the game. That's where all your, your studying goes in, your, your game notes and, and uh, the league stats, knowing what's going on around the league. And then before the game, I work with my partner, Paul Woods, and we discuss what we want to talk about, what's the game story. But it's a lot of preparing. And um, the fun part is actually broadcasting the game. Um, studying, it's like studying for an exam, you know, once you've studied, you're ready for the exam, and so I look at it that way. I say, you know what, do the hard work, and then you have fun with the broadcast. Now, do you study just the Red Wings, or do you study every team in the league? Do you focus just mainly on the Wings, or do you kind of, like, have to know everything going on with every single team? No, you, you, you have to know everything, and, um, you know, a lot of people say, oh, you, you have a statistician feeding your notes. Well, TV does, not radio. We do it all ourselves. It's a two-man crew. It's, it's Paul Woods and me doing the games. Now, do you, what kind of work do you put on on, like, non-game days? Like, what's your schedule like? Do you get off days at all, or is it always you're working 24-7, you're always watching the games, you're always watching Sports Center? Tell me about it. How do you go about it? Well, it can be a grind at times because um, not only home games, but you're, you're traveling with the team, and, and there are days where you just don't have days off. Um, I think baseball's tougher. I don't know how guys like Dan Dickerson, Jim Price do it. I mean, 162 games. 
we're fortunate we do two in a row and then we get a day off and maybe do another one. But you know, just a typical week, you, you have three to four games. You might play three at home, one on the road. And then when there's a day off, that's when I do a radio show. So you really don't have a lot of time off uh, during the season. Uh, in the postseason, you do. You have an opportunity to relax a little bit, slow down. Um, I still have things that I need to do here at the Joe during the summertime. That's another misconception. People think, oh, you got the whole summer off. <laughs> summer no, vacation, no, no. That's, right? That's not it. it. It slows down, but you're still working on the next season. And now with the new arena, uh, we're all involved in that, so that's really, that's really exciting, too. Coming up, I asked Ken Cow what it's like to travel with the team. Now, I think you said that you travel with the team. Uh, what, tell me what's that like. Do, you, do some of the players, are they a little bit annoying? Tell me. I get a tour of the radio booth and get to sit in on the game as Ken calls the action when Visiting Professionals continues. We taught him how to hit a baseball. How to hit a receiver. The strike zone. The net. You taught him how to hit the upper corner. You even taught him how to hit the open man. But how much time have you spent teaching him what not to hit? Welcome back to Visiting Professionals. Today we're inside the Joe Lewis Arena visiting Ken Cal, the radio play-by-play -play announcer for the Detroit Red Wings. Now, I think you said that you travel with the team. Uh, what, tell me, what's that like? Do, you, do some of the players, are they a little bit annoying? Tell me. No, no, actually, they're all good. I, I, I've never really known a bad hockey player, to be honest with you. I mean, the guys we have here in Detroit are great. The, the oppo opposing players I've always talked to, they've been good. There really hasn't been a bad apple, to be honest with you. Uh, now, with that said, uh, when you're a rookie broadcaster, they always like to play some practical jokes on you. And I remember my first year with the team, uh, I sat with Stu Grimson and Tim Taylor, and uh, one of the jokes they'd always pull on me is whenever we go to a hotel on the road, you wait for the players to get their room keys, and then you get yours last, right? You let the players go first. Well, my room key never worked. So, you know, I didn't know it for two months, and I kept getting on the plane after the game and I kept saying what's wrong with these hotels in the National Hockey League I said the rooms never work you know the <laughs> key doesn't work and and Stu Grimson obviously he him and Tim Taylor were the ones that were putting a bad key in my in my envelope right oh yeah yeah you know this people aren't doing a good job anymore and you know then I finally figured it out it took me two months but uh, I finally figured it out <laughs> but they like to have fun yeah that really surprises me how you said there's no bad apples you know I think of a hockey player I think of these mean nasty players that have all this tough and grid who are you know just ready to kind of box it out with anyone else out there on ice and you're saying it they sound like there's a bunch of big kids trying to have some fun you know what some of the the hardcore players the guys that are the enforcers so to speak are some of the nicest guys off the ice Joey Koser was a great guy you know I mean on the ice I wouldn't want to box him right <laughs> but off the ice he was the greatest guy in the world and uh, you know they're they're really good like like we spend a lot of time with the team as media people um, you know being the team broadcaster they get to know who you are and once you earn their trust and that's the big thing I, th I think for young broadcasters listening right now um, you've got to earn the players and the coaches trust and if you're not trustworthy you're not going to be in the position long so once they know that you've earned their trust things are fun. How does announcing uh, differentiate from uh, announcing away at an away stadium as it would opposed to uh, announcing here at the Joe? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I don't think everyone's ever asked me that question, but um, it's a little bit different in, in the fact that we have a visiting engineer, and uh, now that we've gone around the league so many times and I've been around, you kind of get to know the engineers, and uh, that makes it a lot easier. But, um, you know, there's a lot of similarities. Nothing really changes too much. Um, uh, obviously, sometimes you can be in hostile territory. I remember when we were uh, had the rivalry with the Avalanche. I remember people throwing pop on you and beer and you know popcorn, and they didn't like Red Wing fans. They didn't like Red Wing broadcasters either, and that was kind of a, a big rivalry back in the late 90s between the Wings and the Avalanche. But um, for the most part, it's good. It's a lot of fun. Was there somebody uh, that you um, modeled your game or your announcing around? Was there somebody that you looked up to that you said, you know, I really want to be a lot like this guy, I like his style, I want to do what he does? 
Bruce Martin, no doubt. He was a uh, Red Wings radio announcer here in Detroit for 33, 34 years. And to me, he was the best radio broadcaster in my eyes that I ever listened to as a kid. I listened to a lot of people, um, you know, but I just liked the way he called the game. And, and I said, you know, I'd like to be like him one day. And, you know, I listened to him a lot, how, he, how his cadence was on the air. And, you know, I, I really studied him. And, and how he described the game. And, and I think that for broadcasters that want to aspire to do what I do or to do what somebody else does and play by play, you, you really have to listen and, and really focus on a guy or somebody that you like and, and really listen to how that person goes about doing his job. And that's what I did with Bruce Martin. I mean, there were broadcast, I would tape his games and I would listen to how he called a play or how he described a fight. Or, or how he described a goal and, and, and how he painted the picture and, and gave you that whole feel of being at the arena when you really weren't there, you were at home listening. And, and it's amazing how life works out because um, when he retired, I replaced him in the broadcast booth. You really don't replace a guy, he's a legend. But I took over for him uh, when he passed the torch. And my second year here in Detroit, the Red Wings won the cup in 97 and it was game four against Philadelphia and I gave him a call and I invited him back to the booth to call a period. And wouldn't you know it, he was here for 34 years. He called many Stanley Cup finals, but never called a Red Wings championship. And he actually called the Darren McCarty uh, breakaway goal. He went through everybody and, and what a call it was. And he actually called the cup winning goals. Do you feel as a radio announcer that you have to have like the voice, you gotta have, you know, you, you hear it and you're just like, man, that's the guy. I think you don't have to have a so-called radio voice. I think a lot of lay people out there look at you and say, yeah, you gotta have this big booming baritone voice and that's nice, but, but I don't think that works for everybody. So you have to develop your own style, your own way of calling a game or your own way of, or your own cadence that you, that you use. So I think um, it's all up to the individual. And again, there's no real right way there's no real wrong way, there's no real right voice, there's no real wrong voice. You just have to be yourself and work at your, at your trade and just be the best that you can be. Coming up, our interview with Ken Cal concludes. And I get a chance to sit in with Ken in the radio booth as he calls a game. When Visiting Professionals continues. Hey, going out like that? Yeah, why? Well, <laughs> What would the neighbors think? <laughs> I see you! Come look at Mr. Feather! Look what I have. Mr. Bird, remember? Bark, bark, bark! We're just playing! We're just playing! I'm trying to get you out of here! Even still. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of teens in foster care who don't need perfection. They need you. Welcome back to Visiting Professionals. Today, we're inside Joe Lewis Arena visiting Ken Cal, the radio voice of the Detroit Red Wings. Has there ever been a point in your career that just stands out more than anything else that you've done, just something that you're really proud of or something that is very memorable to you? Well, obviously, calling a Stanley Cup championship, and not only just one, but four of them, and five Stanley Cup finals and a couple of outdoor games, those, that comes to mind. And, you know, it's a lot of hard work going through a long grind during the regular season and then finishing up in the playoffs and the cups that I've been able to call um, have just been the highlights of my career. All right, now going from like the highlights of your career, the very tip top, um, let's go to was there ever a time where you thought that maybe this wasn't your thing, maybe this wasn't the job for you? Yeah, way back when I started at Michigan, I actually kind of fell into the position by accident. Nobody at the radio station at WAAM knew anything about hockey, so when the opening came to broadcast Michigan hockey, I was the only guy that knew anything about hockey, although I never called a game in my life. So they gave me the opportunity to do it. And five games into the season, uh, I went to my program director, Skip Deagle, and I said, Skip, I go, you better start thinking about somebody else because A, I can't follow the puck, and B, I don't know any of the players, I'm getting them wrong, and uh, I don't think I'm cut out for this. Maybe I should just stick as a, as a music announcer or something like that. And he goes, Ken, I'll be frank with you. He goes, you suck, just like that. He goes, but the team's not doing too good either. He said, just keep working at it, 
he says, you know, in time you're going to get better, the team's going to get better, and we're going to have a great product. And so I started thinking like, hey, this guy's got a lot of confidence in me, or he just doesn't have anybody else to do it, right? So um, I just kept working at it, and um, you know, he never really let me go away. And so to this day, I thank him a lot because if he wasn't that persistent with me, I probably wouldn't be in this position right, that I am right now. Now, what's one solid piece of advice you could give to somebody who's looking at the broadcast field, somebody who's younger uh, in college uh, or a 10-year-old at home like you that is looking up and that's their big aspirations, that's their dreams? I think practice is the key and you've got to continually work at your trade and at your craft. And so if you want to be a radio play-by-play -play announcer or like anything in life, whatever profession that you choose, you have to work at it. You've got to practice and practice and practice. And once you make it, in my case, the National Hockey League, you, you just can't say, okay, I'm here. You still have to practice. Before heading upstairs to the radio booth, Ken Cow showed me his office, where he creates a game day line chart for his play-by-play -play duties. There's no real right way to do a, a line chart. Um, you can ask 30 or 60 different broadcasters around the National Hockey League radio or television, and they all have a different system of how they prepare for a game. The way I use my line chart is I have my forwards and my defensemen and my goaltenders, and I go from lowest number to highest number. And the trick for me is, is if I get stuck on a player's number, if it's a high number, let's say it's 83, I can take a quick look down, I know it's Jay Beagle. So, you know, a lot of people go by lines and the line combinations. For me, it's easier to go in numerical order by lowest to highest. That's just a trick that works for me. And here is our radio booth right here. This is where the magic happens. This is our view of the game right here. Down logo at center, lifts it across the line to Advocator, busting down the left side. He moves in, drives the shot, and Holtby came up. Here's a break for Detroit. A drive, the wing score! Power play goal! Detroit on top, one to nothing. Now, I got one last question here before we wrap things up. Do you think this is the best job in the world? It's the greatest. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you, it's the best, yeah. I mean, um, I wouldn't want to do anything else with my life. And uh, I've been very fortunate that I've been doing this now for 21 years. You know, I, I still hope to have some great memories and perhaps call some more Stanley Cup championships down the road. I'm looking forward to the new arena and uh, being a part of that. And I just want to be here for, for a long, long time. And uh, it's, it's, it is amazing. The people you meet, not only the players, the coaches, but uh, the people that work uh, at the Joe Lewis Arena. Mr. and Mrs. Illich and the Illich family have been terrific. Uh, they've allowed me to have success in what I do. And um, you know, it's just been a lot of fun. And, and I don't call it work. Uh, you know, I mentioned about putting in the long hours and yeah, it, time does fly by and you do have to work hard. But on the other hand, I can't think of anything else that you can get paid for and, and, and see games and see some great players that we've seen over the years and just have a lot of fun doing it. Well, that's all we have for you today on Visiting Professionals. I'd like to give a special thanks to Ken Cow, and I hope you enjoyed our visit here at the Joe Louis Arena. Once again, I'm Austin Slaybaugh, signing off.